Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Thank you for joining us. This is part three of God's Sovereignty. Now this is by no means a, a, a history of the doctrine of election, but what I hope that it will be is an attempt to provide you all with some sense of continuity, uh, because the doctrine of predestination and election is not a new thing that began with Calvin and has since gradually lost favor with the passing of the years until until today where it is believed by only a few and understood by even fewer. It is synonymous with the gospel of salvation by grace. It is the gospel, in fact. Every departure from the doctrine of election in any degree has been a departure from the gospel because such a departure always involves the introduction of some obligation on man's part to make some contribution towards his own salvation, a contribution he simply cannot make. That is unrealistic, folks, with respect to man, and it is dishonoring with respect to God. There are no shades of truth here. This is an all or nothing doctrine. Election and the gospel are alike in this. There's no halfway positions that are not a total betrayal of the truth of God. Paul is very explicit and completely logical when he says regarding the method by which man is to be saved. If it is by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Romans eleven six. There simply is no way out of this equation. If man contributes anything, whatever, to his salvation, even his own responsiveness of heart or the exercise of his own faith, then salvation is no longer by grace because it becomes a cooperative effort between man and God in which the decision of man and not of God determines the issue. mention of the words election or predestination today in, in, in 
in any, any but a uh, theological environment, a Bible study uh, class in Bible college, seminary, it almost inevitably brings to people's minds the name of Calvin as though it all began with Calvin and it, that it, and it was an unheard of doctrine before Calvin. Very few people are aware of the continuity of the tradition during the centuries following the close of the New Testament. Even fewer people are aware of the fact that John's Gospel probably contains the most explicit and most frequent statements on the subject to be found in the Bible. And perhaps almost no one who has not studied the subject in depth will be aware that the Old Testament, the Old Testament, is also full of it. It is, in very truth, the kernel of the gospel. And it, and it is common to the whole of Scripture. You see it in symbol, parable, and just plain declaration. Now, it is not my intention in this video to try to trace in detail the history of the doctrine as it was uh, developed in Christian theology since the time of Christ, since apostolic times. But it may be helpful, I think, to establish a kind of framework in order that the serious student of the Word will be able to see the various nuances of interpretation as they were developed by succeeding generations. Calvin, John Calvin, by no means stands alone, except perhaps in the, the thoroughness with which he worked out all of the implications and, and in the, the, the clear thinking of, of his reasoning. John Owen, was an, uh, he was another. He followed Calvin. He wrote almost as much on the subject. But Owen, Owen seems to have felt that the use of any kind of literary device, even just simple eloquence for the communicating of such truths, was unworthy of the subject. And his writing is somewhat hard to read. in many places his argument is is just plain exhaustive i think he's kind of he suffered the penalty of of much erudition by being less well known but let's make a quick survey in this final part of this series of the evidence in the old testament and the new in order to establish, just at least for the time being, the fact that Calvin was indeed continuing a very scriptural tradition by his insistence on the absolute sovereignty of God in the matter of man's salvation. What I hope here to do, folks, what, what I purpose to do, first of all, is to draw attention to passages of scripture which are indisputable and, and really need just which need few words of explanation. They represent the tips of icebergs. Just below the surface of that iceberg is a mass of evidence that only the serious student the word of the word will ever ever come to uncover. For most of us, much of the supporting evidence has to be drawn to our attention. But once it has been, we might wonder how we could have been reading the Word of God for so many years without becoming aware of the, the true nature of its message. In the Old Testament, there are numerous references to the basic doctrines of the Reformers 
to the total depravity of man, to the absolute sovereignty of God in the life of the individual, even as God is sovereign in the history of the human race, and to the necessity of divine initiative in salvation as an act of pure grace on the part of God. Frequently, these statements are categorical. Sometimes they're, they're veiled in language appropriate to the spirit of the Old Testament scriptures, in which theology remains largely unstructured. The basic objective being the elucidation of religious, I mean, it would perhaps be a more appropriate, I think, to probably use the term Christian experience. For the Old Testament is experience spelled out within the framework of history at large. It is not until we reach the epistles, Paul's epistles, which I've, I've suggested is the very lifeblood for the church, that we enter the arena of Christian theology in the reasoned, step-by-step, -step, formal sense of the term, characteristic of Paul's letters. So I want you to consider then the following passages from the Old Testament. First, those which underscore the total sinfulness of uh, human nature. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6.5 Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Job 14.4 what is man that he should be clean? And he who is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. How much more abominable and filthy is man who drinks iniquity like water? Job 15, 14, and 16. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that does good. No, not one. Psalm chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and sin. Did my mother conceive me? Psalm chapter 51, verse 5. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that does good. No, not one. Psalm 53, verses 2 and 3. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Ecclesiastes 8.11 Why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint from the sole of the foot even unto the head. There is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed nor bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Isaiah 1, verses 5 and 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, Isaiah 53, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, 
have taken us away. Isaiah 64, 6. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. The good man perishes out of the earth and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asks and the judge asks for a reward and the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desires. So they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. Micah chapter 7 verses 2 and 4. And then we have those passages which declare the sovereignty of God, not only in the general sweep of history, but in the particulars of individual lives. The kingdom is the Lord's. And he is governor among the nations. Psalms 22, 28. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and he sets up another. Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remainder of wrath shalt you restrain. Psalm 76.10 The Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Psalm 103.19 Our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he has pleased. Psalm 115.3 Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that he did in heaven and in the earth, in the seas, and all deep places, Psalm 135, 6. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps, Proverbs 16, 9. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand, Proverbs 19, 21. Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? Proverbs 20, 24. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turns it whithersoever he will. Proverbs 21, 1. There is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall hinder it? Thus says the Lord, Isaiah 43, 13. Who is he that says, and it comes to pass, when the Lord commanded it not? Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 37. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyre, and every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled. Yet had he no wages, nor his army, for Tyre, for the service that he had served against it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, wherewith he served against it, because they worked for me, says the Lord God, Ezekiel chapter 29, 18 through 20. Daniel said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. And He changes the times and seasons. 
He removes kings and sets up kings. Daniel chapter 2. That the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and, get, and gives it to whomsoever he will and sets up over it the basest of men. Daniel chapter 4 verse 17. Nebuchadnezzar blessed and honored him, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and whose kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What are you doing? Daniel 4, 34 and 35. The Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and he appoints it, he appoints over it whosoever he will. Daniel 5, 21. Now these verses, they clearly apply to saved and unsaved alike. Turning more specifically to the matter of election, to salvation, I would like for you to consider the following. The Lord will show who are His and who is holy and will cause Him to come near unto Him, even Him whom He has chosen will he cause to come near unto him? Numbers 16.5 I have reserved to myself 7,000 which have not bowed the knee to Baal. 1 Kings 19.18 Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee. Psalm 65.4 Quicken us, revive us, and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, and we shall be saved. Psalm 80, verses 18 and 19. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Psalm 110, verse 3. The preparation of the heart in man and the response, the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Proverbs 16.1 Lord, Thou will ordain peace for us, for Thou have wrought all our works in us. Isaiah 26.12 O Lord, I know that the way of a man is not in himself, it is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10.23 Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. Jeremiah 31, 18, 19. Please take note of the order. I will pardon whom I reserve. Jeremiah 50, 20. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Lamentations 5, 21. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. Election is not new to the New Testament. Dearly beloved, it should not be too surprising in the light of such passages as these that the Gospels should reflect the same truth. When man approaches God in search of salvation in God's way, it is only because he has first been called of God and incli inclined to do so, inclined towards him. 
What is perhaps more sur surprising is that the clearest of all of the Gospels in this respect is John's, which is preeminently the Gospel of love in most people's eyes. In view of the fact that popular opinion holds the election to be, you know, some cold and clammy, you know, if not actually a repugnant doctrine, reflecting the harshness and the unfairness of, of God, rather than His love and His graciousness, a great many Christian st students of the Word, they never even look for evidence of the, the evidence of election in the Gospel of John, but the doctrine is more firmly established there in John than in any one of the, uh, any of the other Gospels. And it is for the most part by reference to the words of our Lord Himself rather than, than to the descriptive matter supplied by the evangelist that the truth is best established. We might have more time left. I hope the Lord comes soon, but if not, we'll have an, an occasion later to examine this evidence much more fully, but consider only what the Lord said as revealed in John 6, putting together the words of verses 37 and 39, 40, 44, and 65. We have this clear annunciation of election to salvation by grace initiated entirely by the Father. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And this is the Father's will who has sent me, that of all whom He has given me, I shall lose nothing. This is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes on Him may have everlasting life. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Many of you understand that word draw means force. The result of these statements made with such force and repetition by our Lord was that many of his disciples were highly offended, and why not? Why not? These, these statements simply reduce the disciples' price to zero. You know, because if they were to be saved, it was to be in no, in no sense to their personal credit. But how did Jesus respond to their, protest, their protests of offense? He reiterated His words. In no uncertain terms, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. How that must have humbled them when it dawned upon them that he really meant it. We are told, in fact, that from that time many of his disciples went back and they walked no more with him. Verse 66, John 666. Folks, there is no doubt about it. The chapters which precede that bear out the implications of this pronouncement. We are not born again by the will of man, nor by the will of the flesh, nor by blood relationship, but of God. It is God and God alone who gives us power to become His children, John chapter 1, first chapter, verse 12 and 13. Equally clear is the Lord's statement in John 15, 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. We see the same thing with Peter in his first sermon when he says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is unto you and to your children. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
These words were spoken in the spirit of Numbers chap chapters chapter 16 5 the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him even him whom he has chosen will he cause to come near unto him I did not write these words and in the spirit of Jeremiah chapter 50 I will pardon whom I reserve It is Paul who not merely proclaims the sovereignty of God in this matter of election unto salvation, but who formalizes and structures the doctrine, giving us, by revelation, most of the light that we have on other aspects of God's elective grace, such as, you know, for, for example, why one is chosen and another is not. It is Paul whose whole theology of salvation by grace is presented as an equivalent to the gospel itself by showing that if man is saved entirely without making any contribution himself, he must be saved by sovereign grace. Because if man contributes anything, anything whatsoever, and that contribution is essential to his salvation, he, in the final analysis, folks, is saved by his contribution. If we are saved by any kind of cooperative effort between us and God, no matter how little is man's contribution and how much is God's, then grace is no more grace. Romans chapter 11. It's no more of grace. It is an all or nothing situation. There's no middle ground. There's no straddling the fence. But man's contribution need not be in the form of actual deeds to his credit. It could be merely that he decides to respond favorably to the moving of the Holy Spirit in his heart. Others don't, and they are lost. He does, and he is saved. The decision is his. His responsiveness is his contribution. But Paul is clear on this. For that, too, would it once be become the key, as indeed is it's often said to be from the pulpit today, it would make the salvation of the individual a joint effort and immediately raises the question of why one man responds and another does not. Does the responding individual thereby demonstrate a superior soul? Is salvation then limited to those of superior nature? And Paul says, no, with an exclamation point. No, it is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God who shows mercy, Romans 9, 16. John says that it is not by the will of man, but, but by the will of God that we become his children, John 1, verses 11 and 13. And James says, of his own will begat he us. James 1.18. And dearly beloved, the same is true of faith. It is not even our faith that saves, but the faith of Jesus Christ. Not the faith in Jesus Christ, as some, some translators would like you to believe. So we read in Paul's letter to the Galatians, a man is not justified by works of the law, but by the faith of, and that's a genitive there, Jesus Christ. And again, in Galatians chapter 3, the scripture has concluded, all un, has confined all under sin that the promise of the faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So much importance has been attached to the exercise of faith as the basis of salvation that this has become our contribution. You know, as though a, a dead man could exercise faith in his own resurrection su sufficient to guarantee it. 
man is not saved by his own faith any more than he is saved by his own decision not to resist the Holy Spirit. Because the moment that we allow such a thing, we give credit to those who have this ability in distinction from those who don't have that ability. And, and the fortunate ones, well, they achieve salvation simply because they are in some way different in themselves. Folks that have every right to boast in heaven. But we know that boasting is excluded, Romans chapter 3, verse 27. We are saved by grace through faith, and that faith not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. We do not even contribute our own saving faith. And so boasting is excluded. Otherwise, we have to ask, in what way do men differ? For certainly some respond and some believe, while others do neither and are lost. You know, it's, it's interesting how Paul asks, you know, who, who, who makes you differ? Who made you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Of course, we don't overtly say, you know, I was a better man because, you know, I was receptive and, and had faith. But folks, that is, that is tacitly accepted by most of us as, as the essential difference between the saved and the unsaved. You know, that is between the haves and the have-nots. And from the pulpit, we appeal to men on this basis. And so we proclaim another gospel, which is not a gospel at all. You know, for it assumes a capability in man that he simply doesn't have. Saving faith is not offered to man by God. It is conferred upon him. This is Paul's gospel. And the corollary of such a conferring is, is either an election that is sovereign, but limited in extent to those who are saved, or it is a gospel that is impotent, the vast majority of those for, you know, for whom salvation is intended, being able to thwart the purposes of God. So is, is man stronger than God? All of a sudden now we're stronger than God? No, no. Paul quotes the Lord's own words to Moses regarding God's own fixed intention. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Romans 9.15. You know, of course, the great difficulty that many have with such a a doctrine presented as it is by Paul with unrelenting logic and without apology is that it seems to make man a puppet a little marionette whatever as far as his salvation is concerned so that superficially it seems as though he can't possibly be blamed for being lost I mean how could he how could he be blamed you know if it is not God's intention to grant him the initial responsiveness you know, in the, you know, in faith, you know, even this problem, Paul, he, he didn't avoid. You will say then to me, who does he yet find fault? Why does he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? Romans 9, 19. It's, it seemed to many thoughtful people schooled in the logic of the Greek masters that Paul was undermining human responsibility, thereby weakening the effectiveness of the threat of punishment in the world to come as an incentive to, to good behavior in this life, in this world. The sanction of the law, 
was being removed, if man wasn't responsible for having refused the offer of God's mercy, it seemed to well, it seemed essential to restore human responsibility in order to ensure godliness of life. It was partly because no answer seemed at first to be forthcoming to this question, and partly because man likes to feel he's a free agent, and partly because the influ of the influence of Greek philosophy persuaded people to, you know, that that human reason could discover the truth without. Well, without revelation. You see a lot of that today. That the early Christian apologists looked to their own minds for the answer and they, they and concluded that Paul was being misunderstood. And little by little, man's inner resources were wrongly estimated and a more humanly reasonable view of the way of salvation was substituted for the Pauline theology. Man still needed salvation, but it was now seen as something possible. It's possible with God's help. You know, man cooperating by a, a certain willingness to acknowledge his need and express his faith. You know, that that just that much was left kind of, you know, this much of human goodness had remained to him in spite of his fallen nature. There was that little spark there. You just had to kind of fan the flame a little bit. You know, He wasn't really totally depraved. He wasn't really spiritually dead where he needed to be made alive. The extent to which the adulteration of the gospel had, pre had preceded by Augustine's time will be seen in quotations from two of his contemporaries who were among the great leaders or, or the fathers, as they're called, of the church. The first is, is a guy here I want to show you. This is Chrysostom, a bishop of Constantinople, who wrote, this is what he said, he, or this is what he wrote, since God has placed good and evil in our power, he has granted free decision of choice and does not restrain the unwilling but embraces the willing. And just as we can never do anything rightly unless we are aided by God's grace, so we cannot acquire heavenly favor unless we bring our portion. And in order that not everything may depend on divine help, we must at the same time bring something ourselves. Let us bring what is ours God will furnish the rest. Folks, I, I've, I've mentioned, I've, I've used the phrase, put the cart before the horse a whole lot uh, on this channel. This, the whole sentiment here is clear. Man is required to make a contribution towards his own salvation. We meet with the same sentiment in the work of Jerome. I'll put him up here for you to get mad at. Jerome, uh, perhaps <laughs> the greatest linguistic scholar of his time and translator of the Vulgate or, or the Latin version of the Bible from the Greek, which, which for centuries was the authorized version of the Church of Rome. Jerome wrote, here's what he said, uh, wrote, here's what he wrote. Ours is to begin, God's to fulfill. Ours to offer what we can his to supply what we cannot. Now the writers who came after Chrysostom and Jerome uh, went from bad to worse until it came to the point that man was commonly thought to be corrupted only in his sensual nature while retaining a perfectly unblemished reason and a will that was largely unimpaired and it was into such a theological climate that Augustine, uh, uh, later uh, Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, was introduced when under the influence of Ambrose, uh, he was uh, formerly converted. And the story of his conversion is beautifully set forth by himself uh, in his confessions. Uh, 
So the story goes on. But there's uh, that's kind of from the church to the Reformation, uh, from the ref. You folks, you dearly beloved, you were you and I, we were born into this mess. All right. That's where I'm going to have to end it. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for bearing with us. I hope you benefited some somewhat from this. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.